note here, uh, this is, uh, I wrote this last week, I think it was. I'm the maker of my life. I create my life to be what it is. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's experience and the experiences that I am having right now are the same. It's, it's your <coughs> experience. And of course, I've been kind of playing with this word experience simply because in Genesis 3, that is the Hebrew word nachesh that got translated serpent. And it actually is referring to your, your brain and your spinal column and your nerve system that's connected to your sensual apparatus. Your sensual apparatus is your soul, which is yourself, which is your ego. All of these terms and concepts and ideas are all splattered up and messed up in, uh, in, uh, in a religious system today. And so when I, if I said that the soul, the ego, the self, the mind are all synonyms, are, in other words, they're just different words that say the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. It's just different words, but they still, if I said the mind, I'm still talking about the soul. But because we think from a word, a word provokes a thought, right? Mm -hmm. And so many of the ideas that we get, especially from the religious system, gives us a wrong impression of what the word means. And so I have, I get a lot of uh, emails and even several phone calls uh, each month from people all over the country who hear the CDs and get a hold of the CDs and are just, you know, excited about it because they're hearing something that they have maybe never heard or they're hearing it in a way that's resonating with them. Somehow or another, it's, it's, uh, it's an energy that's resonating with them. And that's so... So when I'm talking about experience, I, I'm actually, in my mind, what I'm thinking about is the nachesh in Hebrew, which is translated for serpent, but I'm referring to that part of your body that is your brain and your spinal column and all of your nerves that connect to the whole physical, sensual being. And normally that's looked at as bad and normally always put down, you know, trying to get rid of your senses, you're trying to destroy everything, but they're not given to us to be destroyed, they're given to us to enhance our life. But they're also given to us to be controlled by us, but we don't. <laughs> And, I, and again, I feel that many times the reason I don't is a lot of the a lot of the times it's the lack of the right information. If I had the right information on something, I believe I would be able to do it more accurately yes. and more precisely. But if I don't have the right information, and I'm just mm -hmm. kind of like shooting in the dark, kind of in the blind, blind leading blind, mm -hmm. then there's not any way that I can get the results I'm looking for. So. Oh, yeah. So when I'm talking about experiences, I'm talking about that. You might say, yesterday's experience was really bad. You ever had that happen? No. And that's a memory. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, my. But my experience I'm having right now is really good. But the key is both of those were your experience. We attach the word good or bad onto it. And, uh, and when you think about it, Good and bad are just the two sides of one coin. Mm -hmm. They're just the male and female. Still the same thing. It's still your experience. So my experience I'm having now is good. Whether your experience you judge good or you judge it bad, if you did not learn from it, that's the key. Mm -hmm. Did not learn anything. Amen. Or do I get to do that again? And I'm sorry to say, in my case, I have to do it again many times. Sometimes I have to do it over and over before I finally say, oh, God, maybe something, maybe the universe is saying something to me and I just haven't got it. So I think that's the case in every one of us, is that, that God is speaking to us. And sometimes we just, like me, I just, it just I'm hard-headed or just don't get it. So you, if you didn't learn from it, then your experience did not do for you what it was intended to do. Because there's always an intention behind it. God's always, it's like God's always were trying to pull us another rung up on the ladder. You know, and and that's true. And and I've said that exactly. God is always trying to pull us another rung. Because many times that's how we come kicking and screaming. Yeah. I do. I, I don't always just come, 
Oh, yeah, I will do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I can say that, but generally there's not a lot of uh, enthusiasm behind it. So most of us come kicking and screaming. And so all of your experiences that you have are yours. They belong to you. And so, and they're, they're not good or bad. They're actually, they're meant to be more than that. So if you, if you have a Bible and you want to follow me with this, I want to show you a few things. Uh, and my goodness, these uh, people look at these CDs, uh, DVDs, and uh, they, uh, they get their head challenged. And, and I know that, and I don't, I'm not doing this to challenge somebody's religious idea or to hurt the religious idea. I do this because it's, it's just in me to do it, and I have done so much research, and I continue to do research, and it, the picture for me gets clearer. Mm -hmm. And I say things that people say, what? And, uh, and uh, you know, I understand. So Genesis 1, 26, familiar. Any of these passages of Scripture that I will use are going to be familiar passages, but how I might use it or what I might say from it is not familiar. <laughs> people say, how, how do you get that? <coughs> they do. They call me, how did you get that? And I said, well... Out of 35 years of just research and 35 years of study, it's not hard. It's a matter of deduction or addition. I deducted this and I added that, or I did this and I did that, and it comes up to this. So this is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so Genesis 1.26, and then uh, hold your place there. It's real easy. We find, and just flip over to the New Testament to Luke. Let me read this one first. Uh, Luke chapter 6, I believe it is. Yeah, Luke chapter 6. And, it, and again, this, we've all heard it. I know we've heard it somewhere. Preacher preached it or somebody's mentioned it and, it's, and we all are familiar with it in some way. Luke chapter 6 and look at verse 47. It says, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, the word heareth actually in the Greek actually means to understand. Have you ever heard something and didn't understand it? Mm -hmm. You see, that happens to a lot of people. A lot of people hear but don't understand. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, and that happens to me a lot of times. I hear but I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus is saying here, if you understand what you're hearing, and so, for me, that's important because I want people to understand what I'm saying because I know what I'm saying is difficult or different because of the paradigms we've had. Religion, religion has done a number on the way we think. It really has. And so, that word here doesn't just mean it went in the ear because most of us, it goes in this ear and it goes out the other ear. So you don't hear it. You don't, we, don't, we don't get it. So Jesus said, Whosoever cometh to me and understands, I'll, I'll read it that way instead of hear it, understands my sayings and does them, I will show, I'll show you who he's like. He's like a man which built a house, dig deep, deep, laid the foundation on a rock, and when, he, and when the flood came, or arose, the the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he that heareth or understandeth and doth not do, doth not, is like a man without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the streams did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. The moral of that story is Build your house on the rock. Well, what is the rock? The rock is a solid foundation. And so what I, what my, my mind goes back, where will I find the rock or the foundation of truth if I'm looking at the Bible? And I'm, not, I'm not talking about looking at the Bhagavad Gita or the Tao Te Ching or any of the Hindu or 
Buddhist holy books, they, and they have, they have theirs, they have their books, but if I'm looking at the Bible, where would I find the solid rock foundation of the Bible? And to me, that's, that's clear. I would find it in the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis because that's where the foundation is at. Now, if that foundation is not right, if it's wrong, if I have that foundation laid wrong, then the rest of the things I build on it, even though I may build with good intention, mm -hmm. I may build with a, with a pure heart. Mm -hmm. If I build it on, on a, something that's not solid, something that's not true or truth, mm -hmm. guess what? Storms in life will come. Mm -hmm. That's a part of this dimension. I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you have. Storm, do you realize there are probably more millionaires per individual that commit <clears throat> suicide than there are poor people? Mm -hmm. That's true. So see, just having material gain doesn't give you that solid foundation, doesn't mm -hmm. give you all those things that, that, that we need to make our life stable. Yeah. But the truth does. So, mm -hmm. so I want you to see these, these little simple things that I'm going to talk about and Genesis 126, I want you to look at a word, several words here. Uh, it's the first place that this particular word is used. Genesis 126, uh, and I'll put the word up here in Hebrew. That's the Alif Dalit and Mim, final Mim. It has a one value, Dalit has a four value, and the final mem has a 600 value. Okay, and that word is pronounced, in Hebrew, it's pronounced this way. Adam, D-A-W-M, Adam. Now, of course, we have designated that in English We've designated that to this word, haven't we? A D A M. And in that designation, we said that is a man. A man. Right? Isn't that what we did? Yeah. That's exactly what all of us did. So hold your place right here, Genesis 1. I'm, well, let's just read it first, real quick, with 126. And God said, let us make man. You see that word man? First place it's used in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. It is this word right here. Adam. Mm -hmm. Now what does it mean? Here's going to be the, the key of foundation. What does that word mean? I guarantee you I can ask 999 people and they'll every one of them tell me the same identical thing and it's not true. Mm -hmm. You know what they'll tell me? That it is, it is a man, it is the first man that was on the earth, and he was a man. That's not what the word means at all. So now I'm going to ask you a question. If that's not what the word means, what does the word mean? And if you don't know what the word means, and it, do you think it's an important word? Oh, yes. oh, it is a very important word. And how it's used... I, it, it literally blows my mind how it's used over and over. Look at, look at Genesis chapter 5. I'm reading from the King James translation. The, the real Bible. The real translation. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I'm glad you laughed because that is a joke. <laughs> Yeah. My granddaughter, she heard me say it. She said, Papa, she said, I never looked. She said, but I did some research on King James. She said, he was not a good man. <laughs> I said, you know, it's amazing to me that Christians don't ever think to do that. Mm -hmm. If they go back and do the research on, the King, on King James mm -hmm. and do the research on why he put the translation together mm -hmm. and then do, and she did all this. Yeah. And she asked me about it. She said, Papa, did you realize that he had 46 or 48 translators to put it together and only one of them was Hebrew and, and he died halfway through the translation. They didn't even have any other Hebrew translation. I said, yeah, I knew that, baby. I said, but most people don't. Why? They don't ever do any research. I said, yeah, he was also gay. I said, that don't mean anything to me that he was or wasn't. He was also gay. And I said, he was also a very tyrant. 
I said, people don't know these things. They don't have a clue. But yet, in this area, in the South, if it ain't the King James Bible, hey, it ain't the Bible. Yeah, I mean, they got it on the marquee on a lot of churches out here. Mm -hmm. King James Version only. Well, now, now, is that not ignorance going to see? When I first moved here, Randy Mayfield told me if I wanted to King James Dakes Bible, <laughs> I just as well quit speaking. <laughs> you know, that's true. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and I, I mean, what that's so sad that we are, we are one of the most intelligent, blessed people ever lived on the face of the earth. We have right now at our fingertips more conveniences than any generation of people have ever had in existence, period. <laughs> and yet we are that eager. I mean, goodness, what's wrong with us? Uh, so look at this passage, Genesis 5, and verse 1 it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. Notice that. That's the same word as man. In the day that God created man, that's the same word, Adam. And the likeness of God created he him. Male and female created he them, blessed them, and called there. Everybody say there. There. There who? Him and her. Mm -hmm. Called him and her name what? Man. Man. He called him and her both out. Mm -hmm. I can show people that. Uh-uh, it don't mean that. Well, <laughs> I didn't write it. I didn't write it. It, it does mean that. Mm -hmm. When we begin to understand. Actually, this word Adam can better be described or can actually be better said from this biological term and I'll just put it up here because Adam well, these glyphs actually boil down to this they boil down to a cell and every one of us comes from a cell that's the beginning of our being mm -hmm. now you know I've said this for years and that's what really throws people off I said the book of Genesis is not a history book nor are the rest of the Old Testament Scriptures. They're not a history book. They are a mystery. And the mystery of them is the temple or the tabernacle or the house or the body that God lives in. That's the mystery. And that mystery is you. Paul makes that clear in his writings that we are this mystery. The temple, the house, the body of God is the physical body. Well, in Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, especially those five chapters, that's what they're all about. They are about this cell, C-E-L-L, -L, which is the basic building block. And you can look this up as a, as a noun. The word, I mean, it's a germ. A cell is a germ. You know, it's like people, I hear people say, well, God didn't create sickness and disease. I say, oh, really? Where does sickness and disease come from? Most of it comes from a virus. Well, what is a virus? A virus is a germ, which is nothing but a cell. You see, God put within you the ability to be healthy or not be healthy. Choice belongs to you, belongs to me. God didn't say, oh, well, well I, the devil snuck in here and because Satan come in, Lucifer messed up God's plan, and so now sickness and disease runs rampant. No, sickness and disease is just a part of the makeup of this beautiful globe we call the earth. It's just here. So all you have to do, you can look this up. You can look this up easy. Easy right now, right in your fingertips. And most people, many of you can do it with your cell phone. I'm not that good yet, but I can get on my computer and do it. A cell is a germ. It's a noun. It means a small mass of cells from which a new organ or organism develops. That's what happens in your mama's womb when that seed penetrated that egg. That was a cell. Uh, as a verb, it means to germinate or it means to grow or evolve. And that's what it does. It, as a germ, it means a microorganism. I, I mean, I just looked this up. You, you can look it up easy. It means a microorganism or it means it's an informal word that means a pathogen. I didn't know what a pathogen was because I actually, first thing I did, I said, Siri, what is a germ? And Siri come back and said, it's a pathogen. <laughs> a pathogen? Who? What path is it in? 
A pathogen, here's what a pathogen is. A pathogen is a cell, mm -hmm. a cell that gives rise to an organism such as a virus. Mm -hmm. Your body's full of them. Mm -hmm. Such as a bacterial. Your body's full of them. Such as a protoplasm. Your body's full of them. Such as a, a viroid or a fungus. Look here. Look at, look at my nails. I have them, I have them here. I have, they're just funguses. Look at them. The thing's growing on the temple of God. <laughs> I mean, I, they, they'll lead, they, some people say these things can lead to your death. A fungus. Mm -hmm. Really? There. So, a virus. Oh, you mean Corona? I don't care what you want to call it. A virus. They're in your body. You're, but your body is designed to keep that at bay. That's what Satan, if you look at the Hebrew word, if you really do the study and the research on the Hebrew word, you will see that many times God sent Satan to do God's work. And that Satan just simply means your immune system that keeps this stuff at bay, that keeps these viruses, these cells, that keeps them in proper order. But you can't live without them. You just have them. But, oh, brother, man, you see, everybody thinks that, no, we're going to go to heaven that don't exist, a place that don't even exist. It's a concoction in the minds of Christianity and the minds of religious people. I told you the story about Sai Guru getting in a lot of trouble because he said, he said those words over in India. He said, heaven don't exist. And he said, all the Christians, all the Muslims, and all the Hindus just got all really upset with him. And he's telling them the truth. Heaven is a concocted place. And you, well, you know the Hebrew word heaven, shamayim, I, I will look at it some this morning, or try to. Uh, so go back with me to Genesis chapter chapter 1 again. See, I, I wrote down. I, well, I wrote some numbers down, and I wanted, to see, I wanted you to see this. This word, Adam, is used... 45 times in the first nine chapters of Genesis for the word man and the word Adam. It's the same identical word. The translators just chose different places to say to say Adam or man. But it's the same word. It means exactly the same way. It means exactly, actually it's referring to a cell, which is the first building block to make you a, a physical being. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's used in Genesis. I said, you know, the book of Genesis, the book, the word Genesis, do y'all know what the word Genesis means? Begin. It means beginning. It means birthing. Mm -hmm. Do you know the first three words in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, is the Hebrew word ba, da, rashit. The word rashit is actually the Hebrew word for first, mm -hmm. or number one. You remember in Genesis 26 when uh, she was pregnant with two babies and one came out first. Mm -hmm. That's the Hebrew word of Rashid. Mm -hmm. You know the Hebrew Beth? Beth means house. What is the first thing God builds? God's house. Mm -hmm. So the book of Genesis is about the house mm -hmm. that God builds without a hammer and without a saw. Yeah. You become that. You are that house. Mm -hmm. No, you know, you're becoming what God designed you to be because that's a part of growth. That's a part of evolution. That's a part of the path that we are supposed to be walking mm -hmm. is to become that, to become that, that growth that God has called us to, to be. And so for in the first nine chapters of the book of Genesis, we find this word, Adam, used 45 times. And then all of a sudden, after the, after the introduction of Abraham and Sarah from chapter 13 onward throughout the rest of the Torah, the Torah are the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, those five books, the rest of the time, it's not the word Adam, but the English word is still man. It's the Hebrew word Eash. And that word is, is spelled just like this. Uh, it's the uh, it, it's the ayin, the alif, the yod, shin. It's the esh, 
Alif Yod Shin. Now look at the difference here. Alif Dalit Mim Alif Yod Shin. Both of these words are translated in English for that one word man. Yet from Genesis chapter 9 through the rest of those five books, you know how many times this word is used? You have any no idea, have you? 320 something times. Compared to 45 times. Now would you say that maybe this word is as important, maybe more important than this word? It's used 320 plus times. Just in the first five books. And then it's used a whole lot more. Hundreds, hundreds of more times throughout the rest of the Bible. It's this word, Iesh. And what does this word mean? Does this word mean man? Actually, it means fire. It comes from the root. The root word, Hebrew word for fire is this word right here. Ish. That's the word for fire. All you do is add a yod to it and you give it masculinity. So now then this word refers to feminine power or the power of, of fire. And you know it's amazing to me that, uh, that the translators knew this or didn't know this. Whichever one it was. I, I don't know. I'm not sure if they knew it or they didn't know it. So go with me now to Genesis chapter 2. <coughs> And remember now, this I'm, I'm using this word Adam to show that this word really it's referring to a sail, and it's that sail that builds the physical body, and so that sail refers to humanity, and humanity can be male and female, and it is. So that word Adam refers to both male and female, but when I get over into this word right here, e -e -esh, it refers to masculinity. And when I say that, I used this last week and I had some questions come back to me on it. When I'm talking about male, I'm talking about generally a man. If I'm talking about a female, I'm generally talking about a woman. But if I'm talking about masculinity and femininity, both male and female possess that. So now then I'm taking some words that we're not, we're not very accustomed to seeing. But when we see the clearer picture of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, good being, or good referring to femininity, and ra, or we call it evil, referring to masculinity. Then am I saying that the masculine is evil or wicked? No, I'm saying that the masculine is constantly projecting forward. The feminine is constantly being stabilized. And so you have that contrast between the two. That's what makes you live. If you didn't have that contrast between those two, you ain't going to get up out of bed in the morning. <laughs> You're going to get lazy. And, and so, that, you know, that, that to me that's really clear for me. I see that very clear, but I see it within the paradigm of a lot of different things that I have researched and studied. But for me to try to say this and put clarity to it is difficult because I people, huh? Because it always challenges. Mm -hmm. It always challenges the things that you've been taught. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just trying to challenge the things that you've been taught. I'm trying to rip them out of it. <laughs> I don't want to challenge them. I want to pull them completely out of them so that you don't think of them no more. Genesis chapter 2, this is the first time this word is used also. And I, I want to point it out to you. I showed you the first time that this word was used. That's Genesis 1.26. It's the sail. God, God after uh, his creation, he's shown the sail. It's the key of that. Uh, Genesis 2 verse 4 says, These are the generations... These, the generations of what? Heavens. The heavens, heavens and, the earth. and the earth. Now you would think that it would say these are the generations of Adam. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't 
think that the heavens and the earth have a generation or I mean, you know, because the word generation actually means family. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Now, see, he says these, the family of the heavens and the earth. Now, he, he's going back to Genesis 1-1. Mm -hmm. Bottom of sheet in the beginning. At birthing. At that point of birthing. And then he says, in the sheet, bara in et Elohim, in et Shamayim in at Eretz. He brought heaven and earth together in this birthing process. Mm -hmm. But he's not talking about something out yonder when he uses the word heaven, Shamayim. Mm -hmm. When he uses the word heaven in Hebrew, he's referring to your higher self and your lower self. Mm -hmm. He's referring to your physical and your spiritual. Mm -hmm. He's referring to the two dimensions of your body. Everybody has that. No, mm -hmm. there is nobody that don't have the spiritual and the natural. Yeah. I, I don't care who they are or where they're at, what their color is skin or whatever. Mm -hmm. Everybody has both of these. Everybody has the spiritual and the natural. Mm -hmm. These are the generations. These are the families of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day that the Lord, the Lord, Yod, Yod, Hey. Wav, hey, that, that, that word, that's, we call that word Jehovah. <coughs> and actually, that word is not even pronounceable, period. I, I mean, even when you stick vowel points on it and you want to call it Jehovah, this, was a, this word is non-pronounceable. It can't be pronounced. And so what it refers to, and I wrote this down very clearly, the Yod, actually refers to existence. The Yod has, this has a 10 value and it refers to existence because it is, it is God and materiality. It's, it's spirit and matter. And it takes spirit and matter to, com to copulate, to fundicate, for creation to even be. And so that's what that, that's what that first glib means in this particular Yod Hei Vav Hei. The number 10 means existence. Number hey always is number 5. And number 5 means femininity. Or it means the, uh, the ability to produce life. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what it means. It means to produce life. And then you have this vav, which is 6 value. 6 is always masculinity. Now if you'll see, we have, we have uh, this existence which is what God does and now then we have masculinity pouring itself back into life again so this word right here is referring to the life that's from without and the life that's from within and it's the first place it's even used in this in this passage of scripture and we always thought it, people always thought well it was referring to Jesus it's not referring to Jesus it's not referring to any particular character. It's referring to you. You have that, that inner life and the outer life. Mm -hmm. You know, and our, I guess our great work in life is to combine the inner life and the outer life so that the, those lives become one life. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's our path. That's our work. That's where we live. And this is what he's referring to when he doesn't use uh, Adam and Eve here. He uses heaven and earth. And he uses those in, in proper context because in the earth, it's those that begin to do what God wants done. Then come down real quickly with me to verse 9, same chapter. Then out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food, every tree. Every tree. There's nothing goes wrong here. When your foundation says something went wrong here, your foundation is built on the sand. It's built on shaky ground. And that's the key. I mean, that to me is the key. If I can read this and I can understand, nothing went wrong right here. Mm -hmm. How in the world can you, how can you do homage and reverence to a God that his program goes wrong? His plan went awry. Mm -hmm. Somebody snuck in. Somebody rebelled against his idea or something rebelled against his idea or its idea and throwed a monkey wrench in the cops. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... 
foolish, isn't it? Mm -hmm. which, which one are you going to wor worship? Are you going to worship the one that messed up the planet? The devil? <laughs> <laughs> or the one that got his plan messed up? And if you're going to worship the one that got his plan messed up, what makes you think his second plan is going to work? Mm -hmm. I mean, his first one didn't. You see how foolish that is if you really just chase that and, and just go after it and go after it and say, wow, how in the world could a God that knows the beginning from the end, how in the world could a creator that's supposedly all love, how could he do this? Mm -hmm. And the answer is he couldn't. And so that means it didn't. <laughs> it didn't happen the way religion told you that it did. Every tree, he said, every tree, the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and the tree of the knowledge of evil. The word evil in Hebrew uh, let, me, let me just put it up on the board right here so that you can see it. And then I'm going to show you something about this word. The word evil is rash has a 200 value in ayin which has a 70 value and it's pronounced ra with a double a ra you have to roll your r however this is going to be really different for you okay but i want you to do a little bible drill with me if you don't mind i want you to go with me to the book of and here in Genesis, go to chapter 38. Chapter 38, just quickly look at this with me. Chapter 38. And look at verse 10. Verse 12. Look at verse 12. Chapter 38, and look at verse 12. You found it there? Yeah. It says, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shearers to Timnath, he and his, what? Friend. That friend? Friend. Just look it up, if you don't mind. Friend. Look it up in your concordance. You know what it is? It's the Hebrew word ra. Oh, really? So ra is your friend? I thought it was evil. Hmm. I'm just going to give you a few different things to let you see this. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Like I said, just a little bit of a Bible drill. Deuteronomy chapter 24. That's, this really this really upsets people, and I know it does. But, uh, Deuteronomy chapter twenty-four. You got it. You got it. Everybody there. Deuteronomy twenty-four. Look at verse ten. By there? Yes. When thou dost lend thy what? Brother. Brother. Hmm. Brother. That word brother is the Hebrew word ra. Hmm. Is your brother evil? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he ain't. Same word, ra. All right, now go over further over with me in your Bible to the book of Jeremiah. Find Isaiah. You'll find old Jerry right next to it. Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, chapter 3. Okay, you found it? Jeremiah, chapter 3. Right there? Yes. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return to her again? 
Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. See that word lovers? Mm -hmm. Lovers. This is the Hebrew word ra. Now I know that's challenging you, and I know, and, and, and you can go on and on and on with this. It takes a little bit of research or a whole lot of research to find out all these things, but then you see that word raw constantly used in different ways over and over and over, whether it's friend, lover, companion, it's used for companion. It's used many different ways. It always is referring to male energy, masculine energy, the energy that's constantly moving forward, just exactly like the raw from the sun. Or we could say instead of raw, we could just simply add a Y to it and say the rays from the sun. Why? Because the rays, have you ever noticed how the rays are progressive? They are moving forward. Just go out and stand in the sun like today in the afternoon and see if you can't feel the heat of it as it's pushing onto you. It will. I mean, you can notice it. I mean, it does. It does. It's not wrong. That's just the, that's what that energy is about. That's what masculine energy is all about. You can't, you can't function if you don't have masculine and feminine energy. You just can't do it. And I know many times that energy may grow weak on one aspect. You ever had your masculine energy go weak and you, can't, you don't feel like doing nothing? Mm -hmm. That's your masculine energy. It's waning. Mm -hmm. You ever had your feminine energy that just wants to build a wall and stay here and ain't going nowhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll box you in if you let it. It really will. It would be just like uh, when they blew the trumpet. Said, dum -dum 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 -dum. You know who all said, I ain't going? The wives. Mm -hmm. Said, we just packed up last week. We ain't packing up again today. We staying here. <laughs> we got our tent set up. We ain't going nowhere. <laughs> That's your feminine energy. You, you, you have to work. You have to work to balance yours. You have to, we have to constantly work at this. That's the tree of the knowledge of Ra and Tov. Those Hebrew words that are used in different ways than what we have been told and what we have been taught. They are used in ways that if we could simplify and say, look, they're talking about my masculine energy and my feminine energy. Talking about my right brain and my left brain that's connected to my emotional, experiential body. And it's my emotional and my experiential body where I live, I move, I walk this thing out. Or I just park here. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. I'm just, I'm going, to, I'm stuck. Yeah. No, God is constantly progress. God's constantly prodding you, wanting us to move. It's God's constantly, do -do 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 -do. Mm -hmm. let God arise. Mm -hmm. He's moving. Camp's mm -hmm. moving again. Yeah. And that's exactly how we need to do it. Instead of getting stagnant and just sticking and staying in the same place. Mm -hmm. It's only, go back with me to Genesis chapter Three. It's only as we will begin to recognize these foundational truths. This is the foundation. There's nothing gone wrong in the foundation. And when you realize that nothing went wrong with you, that you're not a sinner, that you're not lost, mm -hmm. that you really don't need a Savior as, the, as it's been taught, you may need a Savior or that truth that will make you whole, in other words, to, to, to uh, repair the breach between the masculine and feminine energies because it's you combining those energies into one energy that makes you whole, W-H-O-L-E, or in other words, go to the Greek, that's the Greek word, that you get saved. <laughs> And you know, that should be a daily process because you're going to have to work on that masculine and feminine energy every day. I mean, it, oh, I know I went to the altar. I got saved. I was kidding a, a young guy yesterday, and I, I said, we're going to have to get you saved. And he, looked, he said, I don't got saved. I said, oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get you saved again today. <laughs> so that was yesterday. <laughs> That's exactly what I told him. Oh my! And then we get so upset when these these uh, paradigms, these little pet doctrines, beliefs that we have, gets challenged. Uh, 
People get all upset about that. And they do recall. <laughs> <laughs> they do, don't they? Yeah, they do snake in them. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3, and I want to read this, and we'll just kind of unhook here. Uh, verse 5, it says, For God doth know. God doth know. Yes, he does. It, it's a shame we don't know this. <laughs> but God does know. <laughs> the source knows it, trying to get you and me to understand it. It's just like Jesus said, if you don't understand it, can you hear this? <laughs> That's what it, uh, if you can't hear this, you can't understand this, we need to get to a place where we can hear this, we can understand this. God does know that in the day that you eat, what are you going to eat from? You're going to eat from this knowledge of raw and told. Mm -hmm. You're going to eat from this knowledge of the masculine and the feminine. Mm -hmm. You're going to balance these energies. We have to learn to digest this. We've got to learn to assimilate this and ingest it and take it inside us. Yeah. It has to become the life. If God does know that in, 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 you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened. Yes. Hallelujah. There is a phrase that we use. I use it. Sometimes I catch myself and I wish I hadn't used it, but I don't know any other way to say it. We take this phrase that your eyes will be opened and we use the phrase, I use the phrase myself, we're waking up. We aren't waking up, we're awake. We are becoming aware of our wakefulness. And there's a huge difference. If I come more and more aware of my wakefulness, the fact that I am awake, mm -hmm. I slept last night. And I'm not going through my day asleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely not going to go through my life asleep. But we are taught from different religious concepts and ideas, New Age religion, as well as Christian religion. And again, I say it myself sometimes. Uh, we're waking up. We are awake. Amen. We are becoming more and more aware of our wakefulness. That's exactly what he says right here. Your eyes will be opened. The opening of my eyes is my awareness of these marvelous truths that are all around me. They're right here. They're in front of me everywhere. Because, you know, God has put me in the Garden of Eden. God's put me in this paradise. Now, if I want to make a hell out of it and tear it all to pieces and rack it full of sickness and disease, I can. If I just if I don't treat this temple and tabernacle the way that I have been given it to be treated, if I abuse it, I misuse it, then it can't serve me the way it's designed. If I will wake up and begin to use it the way God designed for me to use it, then it will serve me for, its, for my greater good, for my greater mm -hmm. uh, experience. Mm -hmm. my, you know, yes. God does know that when you, if you and I see it. Get the foundation correct, we will see it. Let me close with this. The physical world is the only place to experience the ups and the downs, the pains and the bliss, the happy, the sad. All of these experiences are bound to the earth, the natural, the physical realm. They're here. And when I, when I say that, I'm not saying that there are not other realms. I'm not saying that somewhere out in space that there's not fourth and fifth and tenth and twelfth dimensional realities. I'm not saying that that don't exist at all. I'm saying right here in the earth is a three-dimensional world. That's the world we're in right now. Mm -hmm. All these others are speculations. And that's fine to speculate. I'm not against that. But this is the realm that we're in. We're in the natural realm. And this realm is designed to be a garden of Eden. It's designed, I mean, look at it. Mm -hmm. It is so filled with lush and plush I, I mean look at us we're the same I mean it's a, it's a realm of just growth mm -hmm. it's designed for that for true evolution or for true growth experience may not be our best teacher and, and I'm putting kind of a question may not be mm -hmm. but I can tell you for myself 
many of my experiences, whether I call them good or bad, have been some of my greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. So anyway, experience may or may not be your best teacher, but it is a good backup teacher. In other words, you cannot know pain etherically. In other words, what I'm saying about that, you cannot have any idea what pain is in your idea of what heaven is. Because your idea of what heaven is, it don't exist. Nor does any of the other things of this dimension exist. You cannot experience pain etherically. You cannot suppose what pain feels like. And we do not need to get stuck in what it is, like in a habit that doesn't serve me for my greater good, or an addiction, or any other thing that we get stuck in. Many hurts and disappointments are the results of a teaching or a separation from the source that we would call God. And so getting back to the foundation, and getting back to the foundational truths to me is where we begin to build our house that stands against the storms that life will continue to throw at. You don't get to a certain place. Oh, I'm 70 year old, bless God, I have arrived. And now that I ain't going to have no more shaky days, no more hard times. No. <coughs> you know what that is? That's bull. <laughs> Bullshit. Darn. That's exactly what that is. That does not exist. Because every day is designed to present to you a challenge mm -hmm. and it's designed to present that challenge to you for your greater good, mm -hmm. for your greater expansion. For yeah. accomplishment. If, amen. For your accomplishment. To make you, you see, if you are going to be pure gold, then you have to be tried in the fire. And the fires of this earth and the furnaces of this earth are the places that God designed for that to take place. Mm -hmm. So that you and me can become a greater you and me. So that I can, uh, I can get past my past. <laughs> that doesn't mean forget it. No. But you can, you can pretend like it don't exist, but you won't forget it. It'll come up at some of the most un, un, uh, times. It will come up times you just wish it didn't come up. There it is. Inopportune times. Yeah, there you go. Inopportune times. All right, hallelujah. So, the to, to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are good and uh, raw and told is a daily process. To learn to, to, to learn to see your masculinity and your femininity and bring them to a balance. And for me, I can see that in, in the birthing process, many men Males come out of that womb with a stronger feminine attribute than masculine. And many females come out with a stronger masculine attribute than they have feminine. So what do you think their life will look like as they begin to develop it? Well, she will have more Male, so you'll see, be stronger in a male. I mean, these things are so simple. If we could just get past our judgments, mm -hmm. you understand? It's our judgments that stands in the light. Well, bless God, judging him or her or them or they. <laughs> we get past that and live and let live. Just let people be. We can work out their own salvation. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, when the seed impregnates the egg, it's both male and female. And there's a, in the woman, the estrogen washes over the egg and determines the sex of that egg because it's both male and female. Exactly. And after that process happens, if the process is not perfect, then it washes more femininity or the masculinity of the egg. So when the egg finally reaches and matures and comes out, they could be more feminine or they could be more masculine and which we know it you know we equate our judgments and all that. But that's what happens 
and a lot of people say is that uh, gayism or lesbianism and all that is a choice, but I don't think it is. I think it happens in the process. Absolutely. And they have to deal with it. That's they, right. They have to learn how to try to balance that out, and society is such a stand against it. And, and you know, I have my own personal problems with it, but it's still, I realize they don't have a choice. It's something that they have to work their balance out. In life, they have to, you know, and we have come more acceptable to say, okay, lean to your feminine side, lean to your masculine side, go ahead and do this because you're not happy, you're not, you're not building, and they are, you know, they, these people have great mental issues if they're not released to be able just to live their life. Well, they're in prison all their life. Yeah. They have and, to live well, in prison. And the more we work towards that is, you know, the, the more they will become freer. Right. To be able to balance their masculinity and femininity, you know, just. Exactly. Uh, exactly, and to me that's what's so beautiful about this whole picture of the foundation. The clearer that picture gets, the freer I get from the judgment that I give. Yeah. Because now I don't have to judge anybody. Well, and it ain't mine to judge. If you want to go, and even if you want to take the literal view that Christians say they take and don't really take, what were the teachings of Jesus? Love, love, don't judge. Quit worrying about the splinter in their eye when you got a love in yours. These are the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And on all of these two, all of the laws and the prophets are bound. That's what Jesus taught. So if you want, even if you want to take him literal, exactly. which the church doesn't, he said, love, love, love. Yeah. Sat down with a Samaritan woman. They were half-breed Jews. They were like, would have been sitting down with a Muslim the day after 9-11. Sat down with her and told her about the rivers of life at the well. Was brought the woman caught supposedly in the very act of adultery. Looks up after all the other men and walks up. Oh, I'll continue. Go your way. That's accepting. And don't, you don't have to judge. I don't have to agree. I don't have to understand somebody else's stance. Mm -hmm. But it's not my place to judge them. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, if you want to take it literal and say you're a Christian, Christian is following Christ, and that's what he taught. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the BS that we've turned into the doctrines. Right, exactly. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Happy trade. <coughs>